all this is dr mobin sayed from drbean.com welcome to one more show i hope you had a great weekend was it a weekend yes plus you had a great christmas off as well holiday as well you celebrated it you are rested and relaxed so hopefully you'll continue to have fun as the new year swings by um, at the same time there are three cool beans who um, if you can uh, uh, you know send your wishes and prayers uh, reema is not feeling well i think that she she will be okay in another day or so uh, margaret is under the weather and roman is i believe uh, fighting with the long covid so please send your wishes and let's start our uh, discussion for today this discussion when i read it it made me worried then uh, i also thought that this is a hypothetical um, theoretical mechanism so it may not be too worrisome at the same time we do see that some people do become long covid after covid that is a known thing and one area where uh, doctors scholars researchers and the healthcare administrators are still kind of hesitant is the post vaccine long term uh, side effects and so we should there, there are short term side effects that are known but a little longer side effects and i think that this theory Uh, can help explain some of that but my purpose is not to say here we are aft now but instead my purpose is to say here is another possibility for a mechanism for long covid or after vaccine side effects that may be lingering and how to then combat that how to fix that so again the intent and the purpose is to look at how to fix it at the same time i believe that this should mean that spike type proteins that are used in vaccines should not be used ideally vaccines should be of other types other than spike and i would explain in the talk this is my opinion not of the authors so let's start so here are the references this is drbean.com this is the uc davis university of california davis this is their news room so this discussion is actually coming from uc davis and the doctors who have worked on it check their out check check it out their credentials so one of them is the uc davis vice chair of research and distinguished professor of dermatology and internal medicine william murphy and a professor of medicine at harvard medical school dan longo so these are the two uh, folks who have worked on it of course very reputable very respectable and very uh, distinguished so interesting theory this is the theory i'll go over this in a second with you then this is the nobel nobel laureate whose theory or hypothesis is used so neil k jern is the person whose hypothesis is used here this is the nobel prize site and then there are some very interesting talks about these mechanisms and neil had started a discussion of where is that i had that i think it is here neil had started a discussion of the grammar of immunology so what he said was that immune system also has a grammar of working and we should look at that grammar and we should understand it so these are the references these links are present in the description as well now let's start our discussion so i'm going to today I did not start my drawing board early on that is interesting so apologies for that here <clears throat> so welcome to the welcome to the humanities coffee shop and for, with the gifts of humanity let's start a discussion so this is the omicron the discussion is this there is a theory by neil that theory is called network hypothesis and that is what i'll explain today according to that hypothesis it could be occurring this uh, this mechanism may be occurring now in covid patients and in people who are getting vaccinated with those vaccines that will produce spike protein either they, these themselves are spikes for example novavax or could be making spikes for example 
messenger RNA or adenovirus based. So let's, uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that this does not happen in everyone. And we no know that po post vaccine injury is the immediate acute injury are rare. And then the lingering injuries are also not occurring in everyone. Similarly, long COVID does not occur in everyone. And this would actually, this mechanism actually explains why. And that is very interesting part. So this could explain the long COVID toxicity. And they used this word, rare vaccine toxicity. So before folks become upset that why did I talk about vaccines? So here, if I go to this paper, and if I read it here, the development of multiple efficacious vaccines has been critical in the control of this pandemic, of the pandemic, but their efficacy has been limited by the appearance of viral variants and the vaccines can be associated with rare off-target or toxic effects, including allergic reactions, myocarditis and immune-mediated thrombosis and thrombocytopenia in some healthy adults. See, some healthy adults, not all. Many of these phenomena are likely to be immune mediated. And this is what I had been saying for about a year now. Let's, let's continue. This is a very, very important discussion today. So I added this, that why in some folks vaccines or a second exposure seems to help reduce the symptoms. So you may have seen those discussions over here that sometimes people say that I had long COVID or I had post vaccine lingering side effects. And then I had another dose of vaccine and I felt better. And some of them may have said that, hey, then it returned after a month or so. So that all can be explained with this, uh, with this uh, <laughs> mechanism. And my apologies, I, I chuckled because Kyrie is playing with the tripod for the camera. So the camera is shaking. So my apologies for that. <laughs> okay. So we may, this is me, not the authors. We may need to re, rethink, and I wish I knew the spelling for rethink. We may need to rethink vaccine design away from spike. Okay, so let's start the theory. The theory is this. So now I need your attention. It's a very simple theory. However, there is a one thought jump that we would need. So please give me your attention. So here. This is the virus, and we know that virus has a spike protein. For the simplicity of our discussion, what I did was the receptor binding area. I have made over here two little binding amino acids, just two. So of course, the spike protein's receptor binding area has a lot of amino acids. I just picked two. And here, this is the ACE2 receptor on the um, cell. And again, I just made that ACE2 receptor as if it can fit with these two amino acids only. Just simplified it. Now, in reality, it's not only the structure that has to fit, but it has to be electromagnetic forces as well that have to fit as well. So there are more things than just the shape, but I'm going to use the shape for our discussion. So keep this in mind because this concept is going to occur again and again. The, the reason that spike protein and attached to ACE2 is because it has a shape on the receptor binding domain that can work with the ACE2. Once it is attached to ACE2, then it causes two types of effects. One effect is that this receptor is not available to the normal ACE activity. So because this is occupied and it would then be downregulated. Second effect is that when the spike or anything binds here to ACE2, there is an internal signaling mechanism and ACE2's function inside the cell would start. And we know that the pro-inflammatory system and anti-inflammatory system will fall out of sync when the ACE2 receptors are incorrectly used by things like spike protein. So this much I would request you to keep in mind. If ACE2 receptor is incorrectly used and stimulated by something other than the actual molecules in our body, renin angiotensin systems molecules, 
then the cell would create some function that was not wanted. At the same time, cell will not be able to do the function that is needed by not having enough ACE2s for the molecules to work with. Good. Of course, there is a third problem as well, and that is when the spike protein binds with the ACE2, that allows a TMPRSS2 to prime the spike protein, separate the S1 and S2. S1 and the ACE2 will become downregulated. S2 will fuse with the cell, and that allows the viral entry. Correct? So multiple issues here. Okay, so I'm going to continue. This is ACE2. Keep an eye on this one. Lack of receptor, I just talked about it. Second messenger system are the systems inside the cell. Okay, so this much good. We have a receptor to which this spike protein is going to bind. That is going to cause pathology. Now let's move forward. How is our body going to work on this? How is our body going to respond? And we have seen this mechanism again and again. It's just, I love drawing, so I did some more drawing. So meeple art, <laughs> I love drawings. So here. This is the innate arm. That may be a dendritic cell or a macrophage. Could be a neutrophil as well, but dendritic cell and macrophages are more important for our discussion. So I'm just gonna use these two. So we have a dendritic cell or a macrophage. They are going to pick up the, the uh, antigen, which is maybe spike protein from a vaccine, or this may be a virus and the whole virus and containing its spike proteins. Then if you see here, Again, for the simplicity of our discussion, I made that part, that binding part, as an epitope that has been presented as an antigen. What does this mean? The, this, this cell over here, macrophage or dendritic cell, ate up the virus, broke it up into smaller pieces, and have that little receptor binding domain presented on its surface. Good. This could be a vaccine-generated spike protein, which is also presented on the surface. When that is presented on the surface, of course, only that T cell will be able to bind here. That has a shape and affinity for this part. This, this is the most important thing today. This, is the, this area is the area of interest, nothing else. Adaptive arm, innate arm, antibodies, nothing is useful. This discussion is important. The shapes, the bindings. So here, macrophage has presented the receptor binding area as an antigen. T, -recept T cell is now binding with it. Only that T cell will bind here, whose T cell receptor can connect with this antigen. Now, can I ask you something? I'm going to start this thought right now. Can I say that this T cell's receptor, let me make it bigger, this T cell's receptor will look like ACE2 receptor? Because this portion that is being shown on the surface of the macrophage is the antigen's part that connects with ACE2. So if we are presenting that part, then the receiver has to look like ACE2. And you could now question and say, would this truly happen? Yes, absolutely will happen. If we are going to connect with this antigen, we would have to have a complementary shape. And the complementary shape is the same shape as is the shape of ACE2. So today's game is all about the shapes. It is a, it is a concerning hypothesis. Okay, so once the we know this that once a T cell, naive T cell binds, then the naive T cell will become T helper two or T helper one. I am yet less interested in the T helper one pathway. It is the T helper two and antibody pathway, which I wanna be talking about. That is what the uh, Niels uh, theory is, and that is what the researchers talked about as well. So let's continue there. So in the presence of interleukin-4 and absence of interleukin-12, the T helper 0 or naive T cell becomes T helper 2. And then T helper 2 cell releases interleukin-4 and 5 that causes B cells to become active. 
and now these b cells are also not all b cell will become active when interleukin 4 and 5 is presented only those b cells that are actively connected with an antigen only those b cells will become active so because i've done this discussion many times i didn't want to repeat it too much because there is an important concept to discuss and this all is actually just context so here the b cell becomes active it becomes a plasma cell it starts making antibodies so here is the second part of our concept that is important to understand this antibody look at this cute little cytotoxic t cell he's standing there we should make him some eyes now it looks more dangerous okay so so here the antibodies so imagine now that this is the virus or you could think of this as the spike protein by the vaccine. The antibody that is produced, this antibody that is produced here, this antibody has to be able to bind to this area. Why? Because this whole pathway is actually triggered by that antigen or that epitope. Because of that, all the cell in this pathway at this time are making antibodies or having shapes against this epitope. If over here a different epitope was presented, then those cells will become active who have a shape to connect with that epitope. So imagine for our discussion here, instead of a spike protein, let's say N protein from the virus is used or the vaccine does not have spike protein, it has N protein. So then the epitopes that are going to bind are going to be those that are against the N protein. Or I can give you a more refined example here that within the spike protein, we know that spike protein has multiple parts. It has a receptor binding domain. This is the receptor binding domain, correct? Then it has the remaining S1 and then it has S2. You could have antibodies against other parts of the spike protein instead of the receptor binding domain. That would happen as well. This is why some people will have the side effect that we're talking about and some do not. That means in some people, there will be antibodies against the receptor binding domain and in some there may be against the receptor binding domain but not exact epitopes. You'll become clear. A little later as well. The important thing here, the takeaway here in this diagram is that if the innate arm presents the receptor binding domains part as a as an antigen, then the antibody that will be presented, that will be created, will bind to that part of the spike protein. So so far good. It is actually a good thing. We have now this antibody. This antibody will bind to the receptor binding domain. We can call it a neutralizing antibody. When the actual, if this was a vaccine, then when the actual virus would come in, these antibodies would attack that and bind to its spike protein and take care of it. If it was a previous infection, then in the future, when the infection occurs again, these antibodies are going to attack that virus's spike protein and take care of it. All good. This is a good thing that happened. So, so far, so good. Can I say this, that this is antigen specific antibody. This is an antibody that is against the antigen. Antigen means that foreign thing that came in, messenger RNA based, adenovirus based or Novavax based or the virus itself. These are all antigens. So this is an antigen specific antibody. The second part which is important to keep in mind this binding area of the antibody, this is probably the third point, <laughs> so I call it second. So this binding area of the antibody is called the etiotype. The reason we call it etiotype is because we don't know, or it is also called variable region. We do not know what is the structure of it. In every B cell, this structure will be different. The remaining structure or the constant region is constant. 
So this is why it is called an idiotype or unknown type. So this idiotype is produced by somatic hypermutation. And I have done that discussion many times in the past. Imagine like a random lottery. Every B cell does a little lottery and then some numbers come up and those numbers become the kind of epitope it can connect with. And so every B cell is running a lottery in it whenever it is produced. Every T cell is doing that too. And then the shapes of their binding regions are formed randomly because of that lottery that goes on. That lottery is called somatic hypermutation and it is a genetic uh, structures shuffling. Good. So far, so good. This is all normal. And if we reach this far and if it is successful, we are good. So now you can see here that this spike protein is connecting with this antibody. This antibody looks like this cell's ACE2 receptor's shape. Right? Because if the spike protein receptor binding domain binds with an antibody, and we also know that the receptor binding domain binds with the ACE2, then this antibody's binding region must look like ACE2. And you can see here, this is ACE2, this is a spike binding region, and this is the shape of the antibody binding region. Good, so far so good. Now, now the problem, the hypothesis, network hypothesis comes in. This, this far we're good. If this happens, the antibodies are going to take care of the virus and or the vaccine and get trained and all that. Now, in some individuals, the infected who are infected or vaccinated, the antibody produced is an exact match of the antigen's effective area. The antibody produced is an exact match of, let's call it receptor binding domain. Again, I think in the, on a more technical level, we all know that receptor binding domain is bigger. But imagine an important part of the receptor binding domain and the antibody can bind there. We actually would celebrate and we say, this is great, this is a neutralizing antibody. But here is the same antibody that in some people is going to cause a problem too. So now what is going to happen? Network hypothesis. Imagine now this antibody that we produced very proudly against this vaccine or for this virus. Imagine that antibody itself acting as an antigen. This is the hypothesis. And Neil was given a Nobel, one third of the Nobel Prize for that year. This is the hypothesis that this antibody, and he has been correct. This phenomena has been seen in other cases. I would show you a test result for this may be occurring in COVID patients as well. Uh, actually, this, what I'm going to show, show you, will be in the folks who got vaccinated. And this is in them and who had side effects in long haul, and they were not long COVID long haul, but post-vaccine injury. Okay, so here is the antibody produced. This antibody's shape looks like H2 receptor. Now feed that antibody into the same immune system. Macrophage picks it up, presents it to a different T e cell. Now the whole thing is going to become reversed. First we were making the, the shape of the antibody look like ACE2. Now we are going to make another antibody that would look like opposite of the ACE2. What is the opposite of the ACE2? The spike protein. So you take the ACE2 receptor shape, you feed it into the innate arm. Innate arm presents that to another cell, T cell, who has a receptor that receptor looks like a spike protein's receptor binding domain. So that means once that would happen, this pathway would run again and new antibodies will be formed. These antibodies are against this antibody. 
So these will be called in in plain terms, these will be called antibodies against antibodies. Right? But to make it a little more clear, we would call them antibodies, anti idiotype antibodies. So these are anti idiotype is this one. These are anti idiotype antibodies. They are antibodies against the antibody. So when this antibody is produced, see here, it would become clear over here. In this diagram, this green one was the original good antibody that we made against the vaccines RBD, spike proteins RBD, or viruses spike proteins RBD. However, then we made another antibody against this antibody that binds to its binding region. So over here, what are you seeing? If you forget about that there is an antibody, this is really two antibodies, one of them looking like ACE2 and the other one looking like spike proteins RBD. This is why I made these guys down here. This antibody is looking like the ACE2 enzyme. And because it looked like the ACE2 and because we made another antibody against it, we ended up making an antibody that has a binding site that looks like spike proteins receptor binding domain. That looks like this. Receptor binding domain, this part. Now this antibody, anti-idiotype antibody, antibody to antibody, is going to run around in the body. What is it going to do? So see here. When it is going to run around in the body, it is going to connect with ACE2s. Why? Because the binding region of this antibody looks like the spike protein's binding region. So it has gotten a binding region like the antigen. So it will bind where the antigen binds. And if it can bind to ACE2, then it's going to cause the same effects as a spike protein. Now, if this was an antibody, the original antibody created against N protein or other parts of the virus, M or E or whatever, or another part of spike protein, not the receptor binding domain, then the resultant antibody to antibody will not be able to bind to ACE2 because it is not able to get to that antigen. So think about it for a second. The vaccine's efficacy is already not that great, at least not as the other vaccines we have seen in, the, in our life. For example, Johnson & Johnson US recommends boosters within two months of taking Johnson & Johnson. If it was effective, why would they ask for that? if it was effective beyond two months. Similarly, we, are, we now know Pfizer or Moderna, their efficacy is going down with Omicron and the boosters are recommended. And then it seems like every six weeks there will be boosters in some cases. My point is not to bash the vaccines, but to say these vaccines are not the uber excellent vaccines at this time in terms of their behavior. So why not, instead of making RBD-based vaccines, make vaccines for other parts of the spike so that when the antibody to antibody is formed, that antibody to antibody will not bind with the ACE2 receptors. It will be for some other part of the spike or it will be N protein or some other part of the virus. Maybe make antibodies to a bunch of things of the virus and just leave out the receptor binding domain. I know that folks who would listen to this, they'll say, well, we want the receptor binding domain in the vaccine so that we can create neutralizing antibodies. And my request will be to think about it that those neutralizing antibodies aren't going more than two months, six weeks or so on. In some cases, six months. So maybe we should rethink about it. Anyways, back here. We have now created an antibody. Now, will this happen in every person? That is important part, no. Why not? Because this antigen binding receptor 
or the epitope binding receptors are randomly made in every person. Because of that, this, some people will have a receptor that can bind to the receptor, the T-cell receptor or B-cell antibody, that can bind to the receptor binding domain, that area. And that would cause, and you reverse it twice, and you end up with the antigen itself. On the other hand, some people would have, let's say, let me pick a red color. They would have this area, a cell that can fit, or an antibody that can fit this area. Some people would have this area. Some people would have this area. So this is all random. Because of this, there would be a set of people, but not everyone, who will respond to a spike protein by binding to its receptor binding domain. And then when antibody to antibody is created, that ends up looking like a spike protein. When that happens, then it is going to behave like spike protein. And then this could cause long COVID if it is an infection. This could cause rare side effects of the vaccine. And I have to say rare, just so that folks from some areas don't come and shut it down. Um, epitope length, just to keep in mind, the antibody's epitope length is 5 to 8 amino acids. T cell's epitope length are 8 to 11, and T helper 2 is 13 to 17. The reason I'm bringing that up is this behavior is going to affect the antibody more, but this can occur with T cells as well. So, with this, I want to share with you. This is a cell trend. Cell trend is a company that does various cells antibody panels. And they have a panel for anti ACE2 antibodies. Anti ACE2 antibodies. These are the antibodies these doctors are talking about, which I just presented. Anti ACE2 antibody will not be directly created. First, you've got to have the spike, you make the antibody against it. Then you create an antibody against this antibody, mirroring the binding domains, and these would look like the, the spike protein. Then that spike protein antibody will then go and attach to the ACE2, and now it would look like an antibody attacking the ACE2. That would be called anti-ACE2 antibody. This would cause continuous inflammation, number one, because why, why would it cause continuous in inflammation? Because let's say here is a cell and here is an ACE2. And on the ACE2, we have now gotten an antibody stuck here. When this antibody got stuck here, the, whenever the antibody binds with the antigen, antibody has conformational changes in it and it activates a complement system it activates the macrophages, it activates the immune system to destroy this area. So this cell can be destroyed by this antibody now, number one. Number two, when it binds to the ACE2, it would disrupt the ACE2's function. Normal inflammation and, and anti-inflammation balance that is in the renin angiotensin system will be disrupted. Number three, it would cause internal signaling of the cell which would once again be tipping the inflammatory and non-inflammatory system. And the result is going to be continuous inflammation. This is why I think when we had been discussing last year that steroids really help. And then folks have added drug A and drug B and you know there are various uh, protocols. The most important is the steroids. Why? Because steroids, just like other autoimmune diseases where steroid help, same way steroid would help over here as well. Now, the other question, can, I'm thinking aloud, this is not an advice, please. This is not a medical advice for anyone. This is medical educational material. This is for your doctor, for, please, please make sure that you talk with your doctors if you want to think in this way. Uh, this is not an advice. So steroids can help. Then, doctor can think about the receptor blockers. 
Now, unfortunately, angiotensin receptor blockers actually do not directly block the ACE2. Instead, they block the MAS receptor or other receptors. So if we can have specific receptor blockers for ACE2, then that, these will be interesting. There are those receptor blockers available for research work, but not for uh, human use. That is the second part. And then third part, this is where I feel that some people get vaccinated and feel better. Some people who get long COVID, then they become vaccinated and they feel better. Do you know why? When they became long COVID, they made these antibodies. Correct? They made these antibodies. Then they ended up with antibody against the antibody, anti-idiotype antibody. Now, this antibody looks like spike protein binding region. When they take the vaccine, vaccine causes anti-spike protein antibodies to be produced, which would bind with these antibodies and neutralize them, at least for some time, and they'll feel better. Again, will it happen in everyone? No, because once again, it is a lottery. Whose binding regions would work here and whose will not? We don't know. So there will be for sure some people who may have long COVID from COVID infection or who may have some vaccine outcomes. And it is possible that giving a vaccine or maybe another exposure, and I do not recommend exposure because that can kill a person. But if they produce these antibodies again, these can help clear out these antibodies. And that is why a person might actually feel better. The other thing, and I would, I'll go to that paper in a second to show you. The other thing that the researchers uh, contemplated, they said this could cause neurological effects as well. So tinnitus and those things could actually be because of this mechanism. And so that means once again, steroids will be a great test to see does the inflammation go down. The second important thing, for example, if this panel is available from the cell trend, I am gonna see if I can reach out to them and have them on our show. If they have anti-ACE2 antibody panel, then I think this is an important panel to do for anyone who is long COVID or anyone who may have lingering side effects after the vaccine. Then, after seeing the cell trend, why only some individuals? So I responded to this before as well. I had written it down, so we talk about it for sure. So somatic hypermutation, VDJ re recombination, and I've talked about VDJ recombination before as well. So I'm kind of using them because I, I'm assuming we all know these things. If not, my previous videos have them. VDJ recombination is occurring because of that binding regions are different for B cells, T cells. And here, if you see this B cells antibody binding region is different from this and this and this and so on. Then will non-spike vaccine be better? So the first question to answer is, will that do the same thing? Yes. But imagine you take from the virus, you take the, so let's say this is a virus. It has spike proteins on it. Inside is the messenger RNA. And on the messenger RNA are N proteins, right? And then there are E proteins, there are M proteins. But let's just talk about N protein. If we make antibodies against N, then it is possible that when the, the same mirroring would happen, an N protein-like binding region will be found on some antibodies. But those N protein binding regions, N protein binding regions, they're not dangerous to us because they don't go and connect with ACE2. So they will not function as an ACE2 binder. And so they would not disrupt the ACE2 mechanisms. So other parts, or maybe the spike protein is taken up without the receptor binding domain, that part is not created. And the rest of the spike protein is there, which will make the antibodies connect with the other parts. Yes, we could then not define them as neutralizing, 
but her current neutralizing antibodies aren't doing that much heavy lifting. So maybe we should think about the vaccines as well. So this is the discussion. I took your 40 minutes. This was a very, very important mechanism. I just want to quickly go over this so I would not take too much time here. I, I read this part before. Then here, one way of thinking about the complexity of the immune response is through the lens of anti-idiotypic immune responses. The network hypothesis formulated in 1974 by Niels Jern describe a mechanism. So that is there. Then they talk about the how this uh, variation appears. So VDJ recombination results in new immunogenic areas. So that is fine. We know that. Then they say we make antibody one, which is against the antigen. Then there is an antibody to that antibody, and that is the ones. So here, when they say the paratope, the binding region of the antibody is called the paratope, or antigen binding domain of some of resulting anti-idiotype or antibody number two are specific for antibody one, can structurally resemble that of the original antigen, that is spike protein. And if they can re resemble that, then they can behave like that. Remember, I had been saying that the cardio cardiomyopathy seems like auto, um, autoimmune disease or antibody-mediated uh, disease instead of something else. So here they're talking about that as well. So then they say it would be therefore be prudent to fully characterize all antibody and T-cell responses to the virus and the vaccine, including antibody 2 responses over time. So they're saying then it is important to figure out if this is happening and do these panels like you saw here, NTAs2 type panels. And they're saying it is difficult to clinically observe this, but these panels should be done. So here we are with this discussion. I hope it um, is useful. What is the takeaway for me? The takeaway for me is more how to manage this. Number one, vaccine providers should figure out if they can redesign the vaccines. That is bigger than my area of influence. But how to manage this? If it is an immune disease, an autoimmune disease, then there are mechanisms to work with it. The final thought, and then we close. My observation with the long haulers after COVID is that this definitely continues to reduce over time. So that means this would not hopefully become, this will hopefully not become a chronic lifelong antibody production, but instead a smaller duration. And we have seen that sometimes it goes on for a year or more, but it continues to reduce in intensity. So this is the discussion, and I hope it makes sense. I wish you all stay safe, happy, and healthy. Um, let's talk with each other in a few minutes and we'll do some chit chat as well. In the meantime, if you can give me a little fee and that is liking this video, subscribing and sharing will be good as well. And if you would like to support this work, there are three links in the description. You can buy me a coffee or you can become a patron or you can use PayPal. Thank you very much and I'll see you in a few minutes.